So um, I'm going to, like he said, I'm going to talk about DNA repair in uh, contributing to mitochondrial function. And, uh, but I like to, how do I go forward here? Uh, so I'm going to start from the very basic idea that uh, you know, we, we know that all cellular organisms use DNA as information repository, right? And when you have any kind of information and it, when it's important that this information is passed along uh, correctly, you have to, the, I mean, the, the common sense would be that you would have this, this information stored in a media that it's stable, that is safe, right? If you want to have information that is important you have to store in a safe way. But living organisms store information in DNA. And the question is that chemically speaking, DNA is not a very stable molecule. DNA is subjected to modifications all the time. And most of these modifications are, in, are, are due to inherent instability of the molecule. It's, it's something like you write an important message and you put this message in a bottle full of water where you know the paper it's going to you know get disappear and it's something something similar happens to dna because of this this inherent instability of the molecule and uh, and also because of its react reactivity with other other compounds it is subjected to a lot of modifications. And these are just where uh, uh, this, this table is just showing the frequency of some just very common and, and, and um, endogenously generated modifications. That it's not because this cell or this organism was, was exposed to anything. So if you look some of these numbers, they are actually pretty substantial. Uh, each cell per day, in uh, each mammalian cell per day, per day is subjected to about 12,000 depurinations wow. and 600 depurinations. So, and these are, are base losses. And if you lose the base, you basically lose the information. Uh, each cell is subjected to about 55,000 single strand breaks per day. So, this tells us that this information repository is not that stable. So if we need this information for a living organism, uh, organism to live, it's important to have mechanisms that maintain or, or help to counteract this, this normal instability. And these mechanisms are DNA repair mechanisms that repair these damages before they can be fixed as mutations. Because just make it clear, mutations are not DNA damage, they are the result of DNA damage that has not been repaired. Well, and we do know uh, that DNA repair mechanisms are, are important for life because first, for some DNA repair mechanisms, there is no life without that. When we knock out uh, enzymes of the base excision repair pathway, for instance, uh, these knockouts are embryonic lethal. But we also know that there's a lot of uh, human diseases uh, that are caused by defects in DNA repair. And here I have just examples, some examples of neurodegenerative diseases that are caused by non-defects in DNA repair. So stressing the idea that maintaining DNA stability, it's important for life and it's important for homeostasis, because if you don't have that, you're not going to have normal functioning of the cell. But then there's an issue. And the issue is that DNA damage, when we talk about DNA damage, we're talking about oh, a plethora of different things because DNA damage is chemically distinct depending on the agent that inflicts DNA damage. For instance, if you look at the products that are generated by UV, by uh, UVB and UVA mostly, uh, UVC mostly, they uh, uh, the energy of the, the UV is absorbed by the bases and they generate mainly uh, covalently linked bases like the uh, uh, CPD, uh, cyclobutane pyrimidine dimers or the 6,4 photoproducts. So you see, these are two bases that are covalently linked. 
This is very different than what is generated, for instance, by some uh, reactive oxygen species like uh, hydro hydroxyl radical or uh, singlet oxygen that cause small uh, covalent modifications like oxidized bases, that, like, for instance, 8-hydroxyguanosine, which is a very famous oxidized base. So chemically, they are distinct. And also, they are structurally distinct. They cause structural modifications that are very distinct one from another. If you look, for instance, at the structural changes that are impaired on the double helix by a timidine dimer, it's totally different than the uh, structural change that the modification in the double helix, in, in the structure of the double helix, that is caused by uh, a organic adduct, like acetaminofluorane adduct. And it's even more different than the structural change that is caused by an oxidized base, which basically doesn't modify the double helix or doesn't impair on the double helix uh, very much. Uh, here you have a DNA uh, in red, a DNA with a normal GC pair, and in yellow, a DNA with an adoxyl GC pair. So it's basically the same thing. So if, if you, you think about this, it's not difficult to understand that for different types of DNA damage, you have to evolve different types of DNA repair mechanisms because the substrates are different. They're chemically and structurally different. So thinking this way, it makes sense that throughout evolution, specific DNA repair pathways evolved to deal with specific or with a set or with, you know, with a, 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 a specific set of modifications with different types of modifications. So thinking about that, we, we know that we have uh, at least five major DNA repair pathways that are known in mammalian. And I just speak about mammalian because it's what I study, but uh, DNA repair is, is very conserved. So it's very conserved from bacteria to, to mammalian cells. So when we're talking about the, the general types of DNA repair, we're talking about uh, all living organisms. So there are basically uh, four or five, depending on who does the, the classification, uh, excision repair pathways that deal with different types of, of modifications. So we have the base, oh, sorry. We have the base excision repair, which deals with small covalent modifications such as oxidations, alkylations, single strand breaks, or, or small, small modifications that don't, um, that, does, that don't impair much on the double helix. We have the nucleotide excision repair, which is a pathway that deals with chemically totally distinct uh, adducts, but adducts that distort the double helix uh, significantly. We have the mismatch repair, which repairs uh, non-canonical base pairs and small insertion deletion loops, mostly that arise during replication. And we have the repair pathways that deal with double strand breaks, which are very severe uh, uh, types of DNA damage. We have this one pathway, it's called non-homologous and joining, which is independent of homology. And we have uh, recombination, uh, re combinational repair, which is homology dependent. And both uh, deal basically with double strand break repairs. Okay, so we do know a lot about uh, DNA repair uh, in the nucleus. And you know, everything that we have here uh, regards to nuclear DNA. But the, the thing is that cells have another genome. It's uh, less non-genome, but uh, nonetheless as important as, which is the mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondrial DNA, it's a remnant of the DNA from the origin, original symbiont, and it's, it's, uh, it's bacterial in origin, right? And uh, the human mitochondrial DNA, so because of that, most of them are circular genomes. The human mitochondrial DNA is a small circular molecule of 16,569 base pairs, so it's pretty small. 
It encodes only 32 genes. And of these 32 genes, two are ribosomal RNA, 13 are uh, peptides, are proteins, uh, and 22 are, are transfer RNAs. So it encodes 13 polypeptides, and uh, you would think, and all of these 13 polypeptides are components of the, opa, are components of four of the five oxidative phosphorylation complexes. You have seven subunits that are uh, seven peptides that are subunits of complex one, which is the NADH dehydrogenase. Complex two, which is the succinate dehydrogenase, has no mitochondrial encoded subunit. Complex three has cytochrome B. Complex four, which is cytochrome oxidase, has three uh, subunits. And complex two, which is the ATP synthase, has two subunits. So there are few subunits. And if you think about the universe of about 1,200 proteins that, that, that are required to make a mitochondrium, uh, 1,000 to 1,200, uh, 13, you would say that it's not that much but they're not any 13 proteins. They are all essential components of the oxidative phosphorylation. And uh, if you do have mutations, and you see that they're essential, not only because of their location in the, in the, in the complexes, but they are all involved in catalysis uh, and also in assembly of this complex. So if you do have mutations in these subunits, uh, you do have mitochondrial dysfunction. And mitochondrial dysfunction is a common feature of a lot of human diseases. And uh, it's, it's an underlying factor of a lot of very important diseases, even in terms of uh, public health, like uh, diabetes, uh, cancer, all the metabolic syndromes, uh, most of the neurodegeneration have a mitochondrial component. So mitochondrial dysfunction is, it's very important. So if we, so now putting all together, if we do know that mitochondrial, stability of the mitochondrial DNA, it's important for oxidative phosphorylation. And, and the DNA is, unstable and to keep mitochondrial DNA or to keep DNA stability, you need DNA repair. What do we know about mitochondrial DNA repair? Uh, we know a lot less than we know about nuclear DNA repair. And this is mostly because this has a lot of historic, um, sorry, has a lot of historic origin because uh, when people started investigating mitochondrial DNA repair, they used UV as a, a type of damage to study DNA repair, and they found that mitochondria did not repair UV damage. And because of that, this, this notion that mitochondria did not repair DNA damage at all, it stayed for a long, for a long time, from the 70s to the early 90s. It was assumed that mitochondria did not have DNA repair pathway, and it was only in the late early 90s uh, that we started finding uh, that the other repair pathways are present in mitochondria. So we do know that they have most of the excision repair pathways. Uh, they have uh, direct enzymes that catalyze direct, direct reversal of the damage. We do have some evidence for mismatch repair, although we don't have a lot of biochemistry. We do have both genetic and biochemical evidence of recombinational and double strand break repair, although we still don't, don't know a lot of it, but uh, we do have a lot of biochemical evidence of base excision repair. This has been very well characterized in mitochondria. I'm not gonna talk about any of this today, but if anybody is interested in enzymology of mitochondrial DNA repair, we published a couple, uh, two years ago this a very comprehensive review. We cover all the non-DNA um, repair pathways in mostly in mammalian, but we also uh, summarize what's known in other, in other organisms. And this was published in this special volume of the enzymes. So if anybody's interested, I would just refer them to this. But if you notice, I haven't talked about the nucleotide excision repair pathway. And and, and this is because 
what we do have now is that so far, no canonical nucleotide excision repair has been shown in mammalian mitochondria and, and even in uh, lower or mitochondria from lower organisms like yeast. But there's this thing that it's interesting that some nucleotide excision repair proteins do localize to mitochondria. And the question is, what, what are they doing there? Are they involved in, in maintaining mitochondrial DNA stability through other pathways? We, we just don't know. So this is, it's very interesting. And uh, I started, I, I always worked with base excision repair. Most of I, I worked on most of these things here on characterizing biochemistry of base excision repair. But I, but I started to get in, interested in NER in mitochondria maybe a, a while ago because first we found some of these NER proteins do localize to mitochondria and we had some dysfunction in mitochondria that lack these proteins. And an example is here when we show that uh, mitochondrial repair of 8-oxal-1 and is deficient in uh, cells from the cocaine syndrome group B, lacking a protein called CSB. And uh, we also found uh, other evidence for uh, nucleotide excision repair uh, or, or pro the components of the NER pathway in mitochondria. But then, um, in 2006, the group from Eugenia Dogliotti in Italy, she showed something that was pretty interesting to us because she showed that this, this uh, protein, XPC, which is a component, it's a, a damage recognition uh, factor in classical NER, uh, interacted with a uh, DNA glycosylase that is required for base excision repair of oxidized base. And so she showed here that XPC uh, interacted physically and stimulated the activity of OGG1, which is this DNA glycosylase. And we had shown uh, a little bit earlier that this same DNA glycosylase, OGG1, was the main enzyme for repair of 8 oxo guanine in mitochondrial DNA in mammalian mitochondria. We showed in mice, then we showed in rats, and we showed in human. Uh, so uh, it was, it's really an important um, enzyme for repair of uh, oxidized bases, which are the, the types of lesions that accumulate the most in mitochondrial DNA. So because of that, we started asking ourselves whether XPC would have any role in mitochondrial DNA stability uh, through an interaction with OGG1. So to start investigating that, we start from what is the basic of mitochondrial uh, function for us. So we started measuring mitochondrial bioenergetics. Oh, so here, I just wanted to show you where XPC works. This is the NER pathway. It's a very, um, Complex in a sense, pathway is not that complex uh, mechanistically, but involves a lot of protein factors. It's about 35 protein factors here. But XPC, it's here. Uh, it dimerizes with this protein HR23B, and the dimer is responsible for scanning the DNA to find the damages, and, and it finds the damage through through the distortion of the double helix. But this is not really relevant to what we're going to talk. I just wanted to show you what XPC does in canonical NER. Anyhow, so then we asked whether XPC would be involved in mitochondrial oxidative damage repair. And uh, we started doing this by asking the most simple question is whether there was a dis mitochondrial dysfunction in cells lacking XPC. Uh, and we found a, a pretty significant dysfunction. We found a severe decrease in complex one activity. Complex one is the NADH dehydrogenase. So here we have three cell lines, uh, a wild type, that it's, it's, a, it's a normal cell line. From, and these are fibroblasts from the transformed human fibroblasts. And here we have a fibroblast from a patient that has a mutation in XPC. They don't express the protein. The protein, the RNA is unstable. 
And here we corrected this mutation expressing the wild type protein in, in the XPC locus. And uh, so when we compare, I'm just gonna go through this with more detail so you understand. So we're measuring here mitochondrial function by measuring oxygen consumption in intact cells. We're just giving them regular normal substrates and we're measuring uh, what the cell is, is respiring basically. So when we compare basal respiration in wild type and XPC deficient cells, we see a significant decrease. And then when we compare that with the corrected cell, which is uh, isogenic to this cell line, we just restore the expression of the XPC wild type gene, we see that this defect is recovered. So indicating to us that the defect is actually due to the lack of XPC because these cells don't have functional XPC protein. So we see this decreased complex one activity. And what's even more interesting is that we see an increased complex two activity. Just for people who are not very familiar with the oxidative phosphorylation, just gonna go back here to remind you that electrons can flow through the electron transport chain, basically via through entrances. They can come through complex one via an ADH, or they can come to chrome complex through two via FADH, right? So electrons can enter through here or they can enter through here. And regardless of whether they're coming through complex one or through complex two, they're all channeled to complex three, to cytochrome C, and then to cytochrome C oxidase, and then to oxygen generating water. This is the, the normal flow of the electron transport chain. So it makes a lot of sense for the cell to maintain some kind of homeostasis that if you have decreased complex one activity, they upregulate complex two activity. So this maintains electron flux, but this is not all, all well and, and fine because in doing this, there is an increased mitochondrial hydrogen peroxide production. And this is accompanied by a severe impairment in glutathione peroxidase activity, indicating that these cells are under a mild redox imbalance. And this results in increased cellular sensitivity to oxfos inhibition. So if we measure survival when we treat with antimycin A, which is an uh, inhibitor of complex three, we see that the wild type cells show this type of sensitivity. The XPC deficient cells are much more sensitive and the corrected cells restore the phenotype of the wild type. So this is indicating to us that XPC deficient cells do have a mitochondrial defect, the defect. But things start to get complicated because when we try to understand the mechanism of how XPC uh, defect impact mitochondrial function, our first guess was that it would be through DNA repair because it's a DNA repair factor, right? But the problem is uh, XPC is not present in mitochondria. So when we looked for XPC in mitochondria, we did not find. So the protein is impacting, it's in, impairing mitochondrial function, but it's not through a direct role in mitochondrial DNA repair because the protein is not inside mitochondria. And uh, we see this through immunolocalization, we see this through Western blood, so there is no XPC inside mitochondria. So it does, it is functioning through some other mechanism. So that's our question. How does XPC defect impact mitochondrial function considering that it's not inside mitochondria? So it has to be an indirect mechanism. And the first uh, piece of data that gave us some kind of direction where to look to find this, this relationship between XPC defect and mitochondrial dysfunction was the observation that XPC deficient cells, and here we did a, a large panel of cells of, with different XPC mutations. Here we have cells that are XP, wild type for XPC, and uh, we have 
uh, eight cell lines with different uh, XPC mutations. And a common feature of these different cell lines coming from different people or with different genetic backgrounds is that all of them show, with the exception of one, shows uh, a significant decrease in the expression of PGC1 alpha. And why is this important? This is important because PGC1 alpha is a transcriptional coactivator. It's a coactivator of PPAR gamma that is central uh, for the mitochondrial biogenesis uh, program. So PGC1 alpha controls the expression of a, sorry, of a large number of genes that are necessary and are required for mitochondrial biogenesis and for mitochondrial function. So this indicated us in a, in a way of looking for changes in mitochondrial, in, in expression of mitochondrial proteins. And this also talked with uh, some other results and it started making connections with other results from people studying uh, other uh, DNA damage response pathways. And particularly with this work from uh, Ron Pino's lab, in which he showed that in third generation, third mice, uh, when you knock out third, third is one of the components of the telomerase, right? Uh, when you knock out third in mice, because they have really long telomeres, uh, the first generation knockout, they show no phenotype. They have no telom telomere dysfunction. Uh, so it takes at least three generations for you to start seeing a telomere dysfunction because of those long my mouse telomeres. But when what he showed here is that when you do see telomere dysfunction, what you see is that this activates P53. And P53 impairs mitochondrial uh, function through P PGC1 repression. And this and, and then through PGC1 repression, mitochondrial dysfunction, and this then impacts stem cell post-mitotic organs, and this leads to aging. And this is their proposed mechanism for the, age pheno the aging phenotype seen in telomere dysfunction. So basically, we had in the XPC uh, deficient cell line model, we had mitochondrial dysfunction, we had PGC1 repression. So it seemed obvious to us ask, to ask whether P53 was involved. So that's what we started looking for. And uh, we do find that P53 is activated in XPC deficient cells. And this is in absence of exogenous DNA damage. We're not treating the cells with anything. We're just keeping them in the incubator. And when we compare the XPC wild type, and here we're just using the complemented cell line. So these are isogenic. When we compare the XPC wild type, with, with the XPC uh, now, the ones that have the mutation, we see that the levels of uh, P53 are significantly elevated and also the phosphorylation of serine 15, which is the one that's um, phosphorylated in response to DNA damage, is increased in the XPC cells. And uh, this is actually dependent on that increased hydrogen peroxide generation that we see in the XPC cells because, and we know that because when we keep the cells in presence of n acetylcysteine which is a precursor of glutathione, so it's an antioxidant, uh, the cells show lower levels of P53. So the P53 stabilization depends on the redox imbalance that is generated by mitochondrial dysfunction. And this is actually a feedback loop because what we do see is that P53 inhibition, and here we're talking about a, a pharmacological inhibition with P53, P53 alpha, rescues mitochondrial dysfunction. And uh, we know that because we see that the impaired expression of mitochondrial proteins is rescued by P53 inhibition, but also function, mitochondrial function is uh, rescued by P53 inhibition. So either when we keep the cells in presence of an acetylcysteine or when we treat the cells with P53 alpha, we rescue those, those mitochondrial phenotypes that we had seen before. 
And also, P53 inhibition decreases hydrogen peroxide generation. So this is clearly a uh, feedback loop in which the increased mitochondrial uh, hydrogen peroxide generation or the, the redox imbalanced stabilizes P53 and P53 stabilization disrupts expression or, or changes expression of mitochondrial proteins uh, causing increased uh, redox imbalance or hydrogen peroxide production. And this is true because antioxidants protect XPC cells from cell death while P53 inhibition sensitizes them. So if we repeat that experiment that I showed you earlier, uh, in which we treat the cells with antimycin A, we see that the XPC no cells uh, treated in presence of an acetylcysteine, they, they protect, they, they restore the, the protection phenotype. But if we treat the cells with piptrine alpha, they are very much more sensitive to the treatment suggesting that this P53 inhibition uh, or this P53 response is also part of a survival mechanism. And this is actually not, this, is, this goes along with data from a lot of other people showing that uh, the cellular response to P53 depends on P53 concent concentration. Under low levels of P53, this is a survival response uh, and then when P53 is further stabilized, this is a, a cell death inducing, uh, induce, inducer mechanism. So the idea that we have now is that uh, XPC, when present, acts as a, as a break for P53 response. And in fact, there is data from other people showing that XPC is uh, involved in uh, P53 degradation through MDM2. And, uh, but when you don't have uh, XPC, P53 levels increase, it's stabili stabilized. And this leads to a pro-survival mechanism. And this pro-survival goes in P53 impacts mitochondrial function, which increases hydrogen peroxide, peroxide production, which maintains P53 stabilized. And this, under normal physiological conditions, acts as a pro-survival mechanism. But when we, when we increase cellular stress by treating the cells with antimycin A, which uh, acts on uh, complex three, increasing hydrogen peroxide production, then you have further stabilization of P53, then you have more P53, and this higher concentration of P53 is a cell death senescence a signaling. So this is where we are now with this. And now we're trying to understand more mechanistically how XPC is involved in this, in this whole pathway. And uh, if I have a couple of minutes, uh, and this is just to show that uh, this might be relevant to, to human health because while XPC defect or, or mutations in XPC cause zero derma pigmentosum, which is basically a disease that is related to lack of repair of UV-induced damage by the NER pathway. Uh, XPC polymorphisms uh, have been more recently associated with internal cancers. And it's pretty clear that internal cancer, cancers are not caused by UV radiation because UV doesn't pass the, the dermal layer. So this might be a mechanism that can explain this increased uh, uh, cancer risk in XPC in, in people harboring some XPC polymorphisms. But um, I'm just, if I do have a couple more minutes, I think I have a couple more minutes. I'm, I wanted to talk about uh, some other work we're doing uh, also related to uh, nucleotide excision repair in mitochondrial function, and uh, and this is it's it's a it's a work that it's kind of really hits close to home, and it really hits close to home because uh, several years ago, this community of people living in this region, sorry here, in 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 a small farm community that's called uh, Feina, 
in the middle of the state of Goiás. And this is central Brazil. And the middle of the state of Goiás, it's, a, I mean, we are here, Sao Paulo, this is the Tropic of uh, Capricornus, this is the equator, so this is in between the two. So this is a very sunny area. Uh, it's a very hot and sunny area. And in the middle of this very hot and sunny area, uh, this small community was found that has the highest incidence of xeroderma pigmentosum in the world. In this community, you have one patient in every 2,000 people. In the world, you have about one patient in 200,000 people. So it's an incredibly high incidence in this incredibly sunny place. And uh, as I quickly mentioned before, xeroderma pigmentosum is caused by uh, defects in the nucleotide excision repair pathway. And what these people have is... Uh, about 10,000 fold increase in uh, skin cancers because they are unable to remove the damages that are caused by UV, ma uh, mainly the cyclobutane pyrimidine dimers and the 6 4 photoproducts. And uh, the patients in FINA, they are they're really unlucky because they have they are compound heterozygotes for two different mutations with two different origins. So these two mutations, they found each other in this very sunny area. Anyhow, uh, they are two compound heterozy they're compound heterozygotes for two mutations in the XPV gene. And the XPG gene, uh, uh, the XPV disease is a xeroderma pigmentosum variant because it's not caused by a defect in nucleotide excision repair but it's rather caused by a defect in a translation synthesis DNA polymerase, which is DNA polymerase eta, which is responsible for translation synthesis over UV uh, cyclobutane pyrimidine dimers. So it's not involved in repair, but it's involved in damage tolerance. So XPV allows replication to pass through the, the UV dimers, uh, and, and thus allowing re replication to go on and preventing cytotoxicity when the, the replication fork would collapse. So these patients, they are normal for repair, but they have impaired translation synthesis. And uh, what Natalia had found, Natalia was a postdoc in my lab. She is now at the NIH. Unfortunately, she left me, but uh, what she had found uh, during her uh, uh, PhD was that very it was she was doing a, a mutational signature for XPV cells from these patients in in Fina and uh, she found that you know the most common mutation was a signature mutation for UV induced uh, damage but she found a significant increase in uh, mutations that are signature for oxidized guanines. And this, is, this was even in absence of uh, UV irradiation. So this was endogenously generated mutations. So because of this, this uh, data that she had in her, in her PhD, she came to my lab so we could study whether there was a redox imbalance, that are, uh, uh, endogenous redox imbalance in the XPV cells and whether this was related to mitochondrial dysfunction. And uh, she found that indeed, we do have a redox imbalance in these cells. If we measure the levels of reduced over oxidized uh, glutathione, you see that in the XPV cells, you do have a decrease in the, in, in the ratio between the two, meaning that the cells are in, in redox stress. And uh, you have a significant decrease in the expression, even in the absence of UVA. Uh, a significant decrease in the expression of uh, enzymes that are important for the antioxidant response. So these cells are in redox imbalance, and uh, they do and they do have stabilization of NRF2, which is a transcription factor that is important for responding to to redox stress. And so the NRF2 response in the UV in the XPV cells is impaired, suggesting that they are not dealing well with this redox imbalance uh, when uh, 
which is endogenous, but also uh, when you UV irradiate the cells. So the question that we do have now is whether UVA induced, if there is UVA induced mitochondrial dysfunction in these cells, and uh, if does, how does uh, POEDA modulate this intracellular redox balance? Because you know POEDA is a DNA uh, damage translation synthesis. So, but the cells that lack POEDA, they they have this endogenous redox imbalance. So, what is the relationship here? How is that? mechanistically speaking, POEDA is modulating this intracellular redox balance. And this is actually what uh, Natalia is now investigating, and she is at uh, uh, Roger Woodgate's lab at the NIHCHD in, in Rockville to do that. So the take home for my, for my talk is this, nucleotide excision repair proteins, uh, even though mammalian mitochondria do not have a canonical NER repair pathway, at least as, as we know it in the nucleus. Nucleotide excision repair proteins, they may modulate mitochondrial function through mechanisms that are not directly related to, the, to their DNA repair function. So uh, we never have to look at DNA repair uh, proteins only as DNA repair proteins, because uh, even though the cells are being subjected to endogenous DNA damage all the time, these proteins, they may have another fun or other functions in cellular homeostasis. So with that, I'll finish and I'll thank uh, the students because, you know, we don't, unfortunately, we don't go to the lab to do experiments anymore. Uh, and we have two different photos here because we didn't have everybody in one photo. So this is Natalia. Uh, this is Thiago, which we did most of the P53 uh, study. And uh, I thank my financial supporters. Uh, we have most of our of our funding coming from sorry from Papeski and uh, some funding from the uh, national federal uh, uh, research council in Brazil. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. And I'm available if anybody wanted to ask anything. <laughs>